Hey everyone, we're here with uh, Richard Furch in uh, Mix House Studio in LA uh, to talk about uh, music, technology, and cool stuff in general. So, hey, hey great to be here. Thanks for coming by. I right. appreciate it. Awesome. So, why don't you start by telling us a little bit of uh, how you actually started to get into music, what brought you into it, and uh, how did your career develop from there? Yeah, I'm, I'm a jazz pianist, basically, mm. by trade, uh, for a little while ago. I went to a couple of schools for audio engineering and music, namely SAE and Berkeley, and then ended up in New York. And finally, here in LA, I've been doing uh, mixing and obviously engineering, because mm -hmm. that's how everybody's path starts yeah. uh, for quite some time. A lot of R&B and uh, hip hop that you that you heard of, and uh, keep going it on on the daily. So, if you started as an instrument player, at what point and why and how did you turn to be also an engineer? Well, you know, I was I was pretty good as a pianist, but uh -huh. uh, I learned also that you know, unless you're Herbie Hancock. Uh, being a jazz pianist is quite, quite one travel down the road. So okay. along that line, I decided, you know, my side's on the other side of the glass. I want to be able to hang with the cats. Uh -huh. I want to be a cat by helping them, by being the fifth beetle, okay. by being the person that makes them sound great. And that felt like it would be my calling after a while. All right. Do you remember how your first studio looked like? Did you build it yourself or did you go work in other rooms or was it a bedroom? Or <laughs> well, the very first studio would have been like a MIDI room, right? Like yeah. I used to have the uh, the Emeo samplers, the E64s, and uh, we were on Cakewalk for sequencers uh -huh. at the time. That was, yeah, in my bedroom in Berlin. And then many iterations of that in Boston and New York followed. And then my first studio where I was like, you know, this is actually a real room, was probably here in LA. Okay. Uh, and uh, now we're on, in this this version, the Mix House, is probably version four or so. Right. Like this is this is now a fully blown professional facility. Yeah, and this is not only stereo, this is uh, Atmos, right? This is uh, stereo, it is Atmos, it has been always uh, 5.1 as well, mm -hmm. before, before Atmos became a bigger yeah. part. Um, but yeah, it's fully fully blown. There's uh, five five stereo systems here: a big, big system, a Phantom Focus system made by Carl Tatz, and then a couple of other smaller systems. And now added the Atmos experience. Cool. So, in your career, what are the some of the highlights? Some of the artists? Some of the Cool projects that you've worked with that kind of stand out in your uh, memories. Well, if I have, if if I get asked like that, I have to start with the coolest. Which uh, I was Prince's engineer for about a year. We did a couple of albums together. Cool. But I also worked with uh, Frank Ocean, uh -huh. Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis. Currently, Moonchild, Toby Lou. Like I said, a bunch of great R and B: mm -hmm. Usher, Shaka Khan, uh, some hip hop, Jay Z, Outkast, that kind of stuff. It came from a from a start at uh, the New York studios, the big studios, mm -hmm. shout out to Sound on Sound. And mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of where it started for me to blossom. And there's a there's an unspoken rule in the music industry, basically, the success chooses you. Uh -huh. Like once you have a hit in one style, more of that work appears. Yeah. So even though you might have not set out to say, okay, I only want to make hip hop and R&B artists uh, records, that's kind of what happened. You know, now we're adding a little bit more of the Asian markets too. Mm -hmm. uh, we have K-pop and we also have a bunch of C-pop, which is Chinese records, and I work in their, in their A-list artists like JJ Lin, Jem, Tanya Chua, et cetera, et cetera. And, and people from that world know these artists quite well. So I've been fortunate with a very, very, um, very, very good range of artists and projects. How did the first connection and your first project with the first big artist in your life uh, came about? Can you, do you remember that story? I, I do. I mean, it, it was actually kind of, it was designed, it was planned in the way that I came out of school at Berkeley. I went to New York, I got the job as the runner mm -hmm. and I made it through the ranks. And at the time, basically what happened a bunch was people would book the studio and then conveniently forget that they need to hire an engineer. Okay. So the assistant engineers in that studio would get first dips. They're like, can right. you do it? And of course, we could all. We were all great engineers, but uh -huh. we didn't have the exposure yet. Sure. So I can honestly say I worked on the Blueprint album for Jay-Z mm. because of that. Yeah. I worked on Outcast because of that. People didn't bring engineers. Now they have me. 
I'm a lucky man. <laughs> and mo moving on with that, and the same thing happened with Prince. Basically, mm -hmm. he he came to visit a uh, in another artist, Christina Milian, who oh. I owe a lot of. Yeah. Too, a lot too, and she said, "Well, you know, Prince might come by tonight." I'm like, "Yeah, sure, of course," <laughs> and then he did, and we played him the song we were working on, and he said, "Like, so who mixed that?" Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Well, I did," mm -hmm. and he's like, "Well, then I need your number," <laughs> and so sometimes it's just that easy, and sometimes obviously you have to, you know, go to a label, go to a manager, can I make your record, please? Sure. Let's do this, blah blah. But it was very natural in these particular cases. Any cool stories that come to mind from working with Prince? Like anything you can share, like funny or uh, out of the ordinary? I would have to kill you, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> no. Uh, well, uh, one of the one of the funnier moments that I thought was always kind of cool was we were sitting in like this room, doing guitar overdubs on on some of the stuff we we're working on, and on there's like a TV in the background mm -hmm. and VH1 was running, and accidentally or I don't know the universe puts that there um, <laughs> they start playing um, the 20 best Prince videos countdown okay. while we're recording guitars <laughs> for this <laughs> new new record and so it's but the funny part is like it start we both notice it and we're kind of like that's weird uh -huh. and um, then we do the stuff and all, all of a sudden he's like stop puts a takes the uh, remote and uh, turns up the sound and it's uh, Wendell's cry he mm -hmm. looks at it for a while, and he tells me a little bit about how they did the, the mirror effect and mm -hmm. the dancing that he's done, and then he looks at it a little bit more, hmm. and then he just turns it back out and like, okay, so where were you? <laughs> 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 we want to continue yeah. making the record. So they were like really beautiful moments right. like that in right. there, you know. Nice. It's, it's fun. Awesome. Let's talk about sound. So you've been working in a lot of rooms and mm -hmm. had the opportunity to work with a lot of great talent like uh, how important is I mean all the rooms sound different as, are, as far as I've seen them so how does it work for you how important is it for you like can you work in any room uh, do you prefer to, ro to work in uh, rooms that have like accurate sound and how does it feed into your process at the beginning of my career especially when I was a freelance engineer uh, mm -hmm. let's let's forget about mixing for uh -huh. a moment you know, you start as an engineer and you start leaving the nest of like you know your recording studio which was sound on sound at the time uh, and you start going around you try to give yourself a leg up by in my case that was uh, bringing these speakers around uh, the Pro-X to you 100 oh you still have them they still have them yeah uh, two pairs uh, because I think they're fantastic speakers and I uh, brought them around to every session the interesting part is that really fast you realize even though you bring in your own speakers mm -hmm. none of that sounds the same right like it's it's like your best chance but still like the low end is fully different the just the way they fit together with whatever studio you're in, it's, it's not the same uh, at all. But again, it's mm -hmm. your best chance. Um, over time, I realized, okay, so I can't really, really uh, rely on that. So mostly I relied on uh, headphones like DT770s, etc., mm -hmm. just to, to double check stuff. But over time, the only real answer was to build my own room. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in this room, in this version of the mix house, uh, I've been here for 12 years now. So now I know this room inside and out. Every record that comes out here doesn't need to be card checked, mm -hmm. etc. Actually, I am against the card check in a way. I, when you go around studios, it mm -hmm. is really helpful. Mm -hmm. If you know your car, of course, listen there, because again, yeah. that's your best chance to compare it. But really, it's only a crutch for the fact that you are not comfortable in that room. Mm -hmm. But once you're actually comfortable in a room, mm -hmm. having a car check is not all that important. And I say this half laughingly, but also really true. It's like, if you really think that the car check tells you the truth, uh -huh. then just mix in your car. <laughs> and now we can, to, you know, sure. take, take your laptop mm -hmm. and, uh, and feed into the car. So if you really believe that's the answer, why even spend time in the studio and I, I'm not I'm, uh, it sounds funny but I actually think that way mm -hmm. you know so at this time after all this time in this room and the way the way I know this room translates I don't car check I, do, I just know it, it turns out right and it, um, it it's actually one of my most important part of the instrument mm -hmm. the music the, the, the studio becomes an inter, uh, instrument and I don't really want to mm -hmm. work anywhere else for mixing purposes. Now, if you need to record somewhere sure. else, I'll, I'll travel to all the great rooms in town. Mm -hmm. That's fun. But like for the final, I'll end up here most but of the time. But isn't it then also true that you just have now 
enough experience in general and enough knowledge of your room and room good enough where you just probably know how it's going to sound in the car, right? Like in the early day when you were just beginning, would you also say that as an advice for somebody who's just starting out, kind of not to do car checks, just kind of get to the point where you know your room and you trust it? No. I, uh, the, 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 if you know you have a room that is compromised, mm -hmm. the, it's, it's very, very hard to learn that. Mm -hmm. Almost like perfect pitch, you yeah. can't really learn it. What you do is you constantly work around it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know you have a compromised room, mm -hmm. a car check might be a great thing for mm -hmm. you, you know. Uh, but if you once you get close to a room that you actually trust, of a car check is not really that valuable anymore. Actually, you know, I, I did that for a while, uh -huh. and it never told me anything. Yeah. I was like, okay. Yeah, that's what I just heard. Huh? So Let's stop doing I it. guess I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it almost became a waste of time at okay. that time, you know. So that makes sense. So when you were just uh, when you were didn't have this room, right? And you mm -hmm. were working in the other rooms, and you were learning that they all sound different. So how did you deal with that? Uh, cry uh, like, into my pillow. <laughs> 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 that no, always works. <laughs> it's 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 hard. I I, wa I want to say that translation uh, is the hardest thing to, not to achieve, to understand. Mm -hmm. The fact that you could work on something for eight hours and then you go into another environment and it sounds totally different, that mm -hmm. is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. That is really, it's, that's the exact right word. I'm like, you, you put your sweat and tears and all your decisions into it and then it's just not that? Uh -huh. that, is, that is hard. That is something that I had, uh, tried, to, tried to avoid by, by, um, by di dialing in this room, you know. Um, and especially at the beginning of your career, when you're kind of trying to figure out, is it me? Mm -hmm. Like, is it because I'm not good or is it because I don't hear it enough? That's, that's a very confusing situation to be in. And then to strive for translation that is kind of impossible because none of your systems sound good, it's just hard. It's, it's exhausting. Yeah. It is, uh, you know, like there's these memes where you like where people cry into in their car seats <laughs> because they just made the worst mix that they actually spend a lot of time on, and they they actually those people are not bad. Yeah, they are good people, good musicians, good whatever. But if you have a compromised listening environment, it is uh, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. I can uh, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk about. Sonarworks yes, in your room. You have this great room, you're used to it. Now you've had some experience with our latest multi-channel version of the software, so how would you describe your, your experience so far and do you see if and what benefit it brings to you? Yeah, uh, so when you guys introduced me to the multi-channel version, I was just, you know, I just, I just f had been mixing in Atmos for about a year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, like everybody, we're making up our ways. There's some, there's some ideas that came down from Dolby, some that came from Apple, some from other mm -hmm. engineers, and everybody's trying to make the best room. Uh, and some swear by their speakers, some don't. Uh, in my very specific situation, I had to combine a new Atmos set system with a very, very dialed-in stereo yeah. system that I already had. And I knew I couldn't start over. Uh -huh. I also knew I couldn't really use the same speakers, partly because it would be insanely expensive. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one thing. But uh, the, partly also because my speakers are so tuned and so yes. dialed in that even if I had and bought you're super used to them, right? Exactly. <laughs> even, and, and they translate fantastically. Whatever I send out to mastering comes back untouched. Mm -hmm. Very often it doesn't get mastered, mm -hmm. everybody's happy. I really trust these speakers. Mm -hmm. But even if I had bought the same speakers, because they are so tuned and there's a couple of extra subwoofers on them, even those other speakers wouldn't be the same. They would look the same, yeah. cool. Sure. <laughs> it would be pretty sure. clo close, but um, but it wouldn't it wouldn't just be the right answer, sure. you know. So I decided, okay, so well, to get my feet wet, I, um, I, I already had a 5.1 system with uh, extra JBL speakers. These mm -hmm. are the uh, 308s, uh, for that matter. I think uh, Chuck Ainley uses the same ones in, in Nashville. Uh, maybe that's what, how it came up. I don't actually recall. So, but I decided let, let me just buy more of those. So basically, add to the 5.1 system with more speakers of the same kind. Because mm -hmm. kind of at least you know we're, we're moving forward towards something. We're not starting over. And we get pretty close. Mm -hmm. We did a bunch of stuff with, uh, you know, time aligning, yeah. uh, measuring and recording clicks, uh -huh. and uh, shifting speakers and putting little delays in. And it, it worked pretty well, uh, for that matter. 
but what you uh, what you told me, like you know, we we now have a, a, a multi-channel version of the Sona Work Sound ID uh, plugin, which I knew from from uh, from headphone tests. Yes. I tried those so far uh, before that, and it's like now that's interesting. Now maybe there's a way to actually get closer with less work, with more precision, mm -hmm. uh, and possibly automatic, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> right. you, because you have all the the microphones going on, and all, uh, sorry, the microphone measurements yes. going on. And so I was like, let's try that. And so what I learned, what was really interesting was, you know, we're shooting for something that I already know what it should sound like because I'm happy with the stereo sound. Uh -huh. I don't, I didn't really want to change that, nor did I think it should be. But I was really interested in getting the surround speakers and the height speakers, of course, to be in that same kind of world, to yeah. like arrive at the, uh, the sound would arrive at the exact time, at the same mm -hmm. time at the uh, listening position. It would be very similar in overall frequency response and the whole system would become from, it would go from a pretty close to kind of like this is the this is the kind of like static image yeah. of this uh, alignment that we're looking for and that's exactly what the software did do you want to tell tell a little more about how you set it up to the speakers that you already knew yes 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 so basically when we first experimented with our setup here and when you guys came in to uh, align the system we we were successful in finding the right uh, um, t measurements for all these speakers, and, and it did. It really did quite quickly did the thing that we're looking for, which is like you know we're tightening up the f uh, the face between the whole thing mm -hmm. and the EQs, etc. That's good. But it actually, what it did uh, at the same time, it was it we were looking for um, for a target curve that was quite that was unfamiliar for, to me, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, well, okay, so I understand what is technically happening, mm -hmm. and I like it. I mm -hmm. like the tightness of it yeah. all. But I think what I really need, and that this was a, after a couple of uh, good nights sleep of what, <laughs> trying to figure out what the move here is, uh -huh. it's like I need the target curve to be familiar to my left and right alignment uh -huh. because I trust it so much. Now, if you had a room where your left and right was questionable, mm -hmm. You could use obviously the software to make the most awesome sure. alignment you could ever have, but I already had that. Yes. So basically, in my particular system, I was like, you know, we need to clone these speakers uh -huh. eleven times or so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's after a little bit of experimentation. That's what I did. I, I chose a target curve that was familiar to me and was left and right compatible, like sorry, compatible with yeah. my left and right. Um, uh, alignment already, and all of a sudden everything came into into focus, so to speak. You know, awesome. everything. It's the the good things mm -hmm. left and right stayed yeah. the way they were. And actually, they got a little better because now you get a little bit more of a correlation between yeah. left and right. And then the other speakers kind of like joined the pack and became focused very very much without. Uh, uh, without overlapping frequencies or, or, or masking. Mm -hmm. Everything became a little cleaner, tighter, and more accurate. But the overall tuning was what I knew so well from this studio. Awesome. So you sound like a happy user. This, this is uh, it's super awesome. Yeah, no, like, like because you explained to me what you were trying to do. Mm -hmm. I, I figured out what I needed to do, and uh -huh. we kind of met in the middle, and it is uh, definitely an improvement on that well, side. Happy to hear that. Yeah, of course. Uh, Let's talk about Atmos a little bit. Mm -hmm. You say you mixed it already, mixed in it already for a little over a year, I guess. Yeah, I would right? say about so, that. So, uh, how did you first get into it, and how do you feel about it, and where do you think it's going? Uh, <laughs> lot of questions in one, right? No, no, that's <laughs> good. Like, how did I get to, into it? Well, it was actually it was by accident because the very first part was like you know a friend of mine said you need to have an Atmos room, and I'm like. Okay, let's do it. And then the price tag was sixty grand. Uh -huh. And then after I realized that everybody was trying to make their way, uh -huh. you know, um, it's like, oh, there's other ways. So the, first, you had to have two machines. You have a, like the render on a different computer, etc. Like it was a huge, um, a huge hardware requirement that I was like, you know, apart from the money, which I, the money I could spend, but it also basically meant dis dismantling the room that I have and yeah. change it. And I didn't like that idea very much. So. Over time, Dolby loosened their restrictions and basically said, hey, you can actually do this on one computer, and mm -hmm. hey, you can actually use kind of any speakers you want. I mean, sure, there's better and worse, sure. but you can. It's like, okay, and so now we can explore it, and then 
all of a sudden, a couple of projects came in there like, can mm -hmm. you do the Atmos thing? I'm like, well, no, crap. <laughs> 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 and so all of a sudden you feel, felt like there was an actual need, you uh -huh. know? And um, that's when I was like, okay, so let's let's get this hap uh, let's get this happening, and I did it in about I set it up in about six weeks, I would say. Right. Like it, it took a little while to get started. Like, what are they trying to do? <laughs> Why are they doing this? And even though I am very very familiar with the 5.1 surround system yeah. that I had, it's like it's it's quite it's quite a dimension, literally a height, uh, whatever. It's it's quite different to handle. And then you know, even Dolby at the beginning, their renderers grew with us. The mm -hmm. the, the uh, it became less buggy, more user friendly. So it was. It was. I would say the whole transition was from I can't do Atmos to like, okay, we got this. It's about six mm -hmm. weeks to t two months. But then, just like every new technology, there's a huge learning curve of what are we gonna do creatively? Like, yeah. why are we doing this? What are we trying to achieve? And it was very clean, uh, very clear that, at least as of last year. Everybody really wanted the stereo mix, just bigger, yeah. just more around, more kind of like, okay, it should be Atmos, but please don't change it too much. Uh -huh. And the, there's a funny thing, if you follow my master classes, what I do a lot about how I describe my mixing style is I take your rough mix, which sounds like this, yeah. and I do this, uh -huh. and I like kind of explode it and make it wider and bigger and hopefully clearer and more impactful, mm -hmm. all the good things that you're trying to do in mixing. And then I realized to myself, well, that's exactly what Atmos is. Right. Now we're just doing it to the stereo mix and make uh, sorry to the stereo mix uh -huh. and make it even bigger. And all of a sudden, I felt, oh, there's a purpose. This is like the actual idea of what we're trying to do. I've been doing that for mm -hmm. a very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just now we're doing on it on more and more speakers, you know. So all of a sudden, creatively, it was very, very exciting. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to ask, like, have, have your create. Have you noticed any new creative ideas or dimensions come up because of that ability to mix in space rather than uh, the left right? Yes, I would say I would say maybe the number one difference or change or advantage is bef part of stereo mixing is making sure that everything that's in the record actually fits between the two speakers, mm -hmm. which obviously requires a bunch of technique and sure. uh, care for that matter. And um, in an Atmos environment, the beautiful part is like, you know, a part is like really hard to fit to, uh, in, into these two speakers. And all of a sudden you go like, okay, fine. We'll just pull it out, pull half left mm -hmm. backgrounds, yeah. maybe a guitar lick. We heard a drum uh, kind of fill in, uh -huh. an, in an earlier song that just all of a sudden comes from a totally different place. So all of a sudden, creatively speaking, we can solve problems, solve, sorry, not problems, tasks. We can solve them differently because they are now, they ha there's a bigger canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and because most records, most records have parts that are interacting like uh, questions, answers, kind of like things or layers together. Mm -hmm. If I can put these layers into a different 3D environment and just have more space for it all, that job becomes easier. Mm -hmm. Now, once that job becomes easier, it also means now we have space to like add other things, throws, what I like, for instance, in EDM, uh, you know, you, you come into the drop and there might be something like snare roll, uh, more snare roll, and then ends up maybe, let's say, in a, in, uh, in a symbol in a little explosion, right? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully a big explosion. <laughs> let's make that a big explosion. What happens, what, what is a cool move is like, you know, have it come from the back, uh -huh. and then go, the symbol comes in the front, maybe, uh -huh. and then the, the tail of that kind of splashes over the whole field back into the back. Oh, These that, are like cool, cool movements that you can do that add to the actual instrumentation uh -huh. that is already there. That's how the creativity can get a little bit like more elevated there. Awesome. So do you feel, uh, how, how do you feel about where Atmos is right now? Is it kind of growing fast, growing slowly? Do you feel it's here to stay? Do you feel that there's anything that's still missing for it to kind of happen or kind of I mean, you obviously have the Atmos room and you're doing mixes in it, but mm -hmm. uh, you, I guess you have a perspective. I, I do. Um, I think, uh, first of all, the positive side it is, uh, is growing. And actually, I'm starting to hear both of my work, but also, obviously, there's a lot of hit records out there. I, I've, 
I've, I'm starting to hear quality and ideas that is actually goes far beyond in a good way mm -hmm. the, to, this, uh, to the stereo mix, where all of a sudden there, is, uh, uh, there are records where I like, go back between stereo and Atmos and like, the Atmos is definitely better. I, I don't know exactly why or uh -huh. what's going on, but it's actually better. While about, I don't know, half a year ago, yeah. I was like, well, you know, I don't know, I, I might actually uh, like the stereo <laughs> better, I don't know, maybe we were just better because we've been doing it for sure. 40 years, I don't know. But I've yeah, have definitely I've factors in, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is, it's a practicing basic, right? We're all practicing, no, like all the engineers I talk to, we're all going like, have you heard this? Or how did you do that? Or like, did, I did this mix yesterday and it did this really weird thing, uh -huh. are you doing the same thing? <laughs> so we're trying to talk and we're all learning and trying to make it better. So that, the, on the positive side, that is, that is beautiful. Uh, on the more complicated side, of course, most people don't even have a stereo speaker anymore. <laughs> most true. people. I mean, certainly not kids under 18 years old, right? Studios are moving to like 916 and people are moving to mono. <laughs> exactly. Or like we, we can record at 192 and everybody right. listens to MP3s. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, those are, those are funny, uh, funny things, but it's true. I have 11 speakers here, or if, I don't know, probably more with all the stereo stuff. Um, as a professional, that was not easy to set up. Sure. I was like, what are we trying to do here? Right. I'm just going to tell you that a normal mortal person that is just a music fan has absolutely zero chance to set, <laughs> <laughs> to set up yeah. an, uh, a, an array like this and to really experience an actual Atmos mix in speakers, mm -hmm. where I think it is the most powerful. Like, when you sit a client down in the middle of the speakers and these clients are like, why are we doing this? And yeah. blah, blah, blah. You just press play and they're like, uh, okay, I get it now. That's cool. Um, but on headphones, that that um, that experience is much more limited. It's not bad or anything. Mm -hmm. I hear the, the new Harry Styles record, which I did not do. Uh, it sounds great, you know. Like it's like I hear it. I'm like, wow. I think that's one where mm -hmm. I where I like the Atmos mix better than the stereo mix. Um, but these things are subtle in a way, way where. I think many music lovers don't really know what they should be listening for. Mm. Some might even say, I don't know, is there a difference? Maybe. Uh, the funny part is too, like when you look at Facebook or whatever, it's not like all music lovers are saying, oh, Atmos, finally. No, most people actually don't even know that yeah. it really is happening. So there is education needed. There is education needed as to what are we lis listening for? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, check out this stereo mix. Okay, cool. So now check out this Atmos mix. Do you hear where the bells are? like higher there and like oh that's really cool but but normal music fans might not notice that and then comes the surround dimension of it all that is very hard to hear like mm -hmm. even if I pan something to the back and it comes clearly out of my back surround speakers you cannot hear that on headphones mm -hmm. you hear the sound changing a little bit there is a binaural, uh, a binaural part to it, yeah. a component, that is true, but it, you can't really say, hey, I heard that coming from the back. It doesn't really work that that yet. And I know they're working on with the HRTF profiles, yes. with the Sony 360s, but, uh, but that we're still like probably um, a generation of, uh, uh, of hardware, like specific headphones, away from that being really yeah. um, impactful. That doesn't mean, though, that we should stop. It mm -hmm. just means we should get better at it. Uh, I mean, with yeah. uh, seeing all the big weight tech companies getting behind this, I, uh, I re like, as you said, like six months ago, it wasn't sounding maybe as good as it, good as it does now. So six months from now, it's probably going to be even better. I, re yeah. I really hope so. I, I mean, obviously, I have high hopes for that. Um, the, the interesting part is that the codecs that are being de delivered on phones, etc., are mm -hmm. slightly different from our Dolby codecs that we yeah. have here. That's a hard uh, it's a hard task to make that all translate again, um, but I think we're moving into the right direction there. Let's hope we do. I'm certainly myself looking forward to the moment when the consumers have access to the, all the brilliant Atmos mixes that are being created in rooms like these. So. Yeah, no, I, re I really hope so. There's a, there's a really there's a beauty of listening to stuff in surround, and it always was in 5.1, mm. etc. But obviously. The, the beauty of Atmos is that it is scalable from a headphone system to a whatever 11 point mm -hmm. something 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 <laughs> system, um, while the other systems 5.1, 7.1, etc., 
were pretty, pretty much fixed. You either had that kind of uh -huh. system at home or you didn't. So yeah. hmm, that's kind of it. So like considering we have a format now that could live in all these places, I have uh, high hopes that it will propagate better yeah. and that the music listener, the music fan at one point goes like, oh, well, you know what? Music somehow sounds better than it did in 2015. And mm. I'm not knocking 2015, <laughs> but our job is to make stuff better over time, you know. Um, that's what that's what I hope will happen. What's the best Atmos mix you have heard so far? Oh my! Or what's what's your favorite one, brother? Or maybe a couple? That's a very good question. Uh, f musically speaking, there's some really great stuff on the Olivia Rodrigo albums. All right. Um, or album, because it's only one, <laughs> but on the songs. Um, then, like I just said, the, uh, the first one that actually really impressed me quality-wise was probably the Harry Styles record. And um, there's something, not just the creative part of what they did with it, but also the clarity, the fact that we somehow lost that little random ambient sound that we had maybe, like I said, six yeah. months ago. I think somehow they solved something there, mm -hmm. and it really translated really well. I was impressed. And, it, and that, that one I actually heard uh, first on the AirPods Pros, not the oh. Maxis, right? And I, oh, but you heard it on the... On the headphones. I heard that one have on the headphones. Have you heard it on the? Uh, I, ha MCU? I have. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, and and it, and it was beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that was cool. But the most amazing part was like, oh, here's something great. Mm -hmm. On the AirPod Pros, I'm like, oh, we're making progress. Progress into the place where most people will hear it. That's why it st st uh, stuck out to me um, so so much, really. Um, because that's, a, that's an important part. You don't want to just have more creativity at, at the cost of some kind of uh, technology part. Mm -hmm. that's like, like if, it's, if it's, it's more creative but sounds worse, yeah. then that's <laughs> weird, right? Sure. We kind of want to do both. both. And uh, so that's, that's kind of where I'm starting to hear it now. It's an interesting question. You mentioned the creativity. Uh, there is kind of coming back to the speaker and sound question. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this... I don't even want to call it a debate, but when you talk to people and ask about how important is accurate sound in the context of creating music, and then one opinion that comes up often sometimes is that uh, uh, generally it's more about, it has to be more about the creativity. If the creativity is good, if it's great, then kind of bad sound is not necessarily going to kill it. So uh, then it's like kind of blending into a story of, hey, but the, this kind of neutral reference sound or whatever you want to call it is not necessarily what you have to have. Like if you have a great musical idea, it's just going to shine through. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about it? I, is it true? Kind of do you do you need kind of uh, accurate sound uh, to be able to let the creativity shine through or how does um, if you it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Uh, of course, the creativity, whatever is in the record, musically, creatively speaking, is it trumps everything, of mm -hmm. course, right? But that doesn't mean that, like, my job is not to rewrite the song. Mm -hmm. My job is to make the song as powerful, as creative as I can with what's there. And technically speaking, that's part of my tool to get there. Mm -hmm. So I, I am the person who can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. So basically, if, if we're finally at the end of a mix or the end of something, and somebody has the creativity and it rules, but it kind of sounds odd, of course they win. But sure. my job is to try to get both there, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Um, Makes sense. It's, it's basically, it's the same as the, if somebody says, you know, a hit, a hit record might always be a hit record, even if it sounded a little bad. Mm -hmm. True, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't try to make it sound right. the best <laughs> I can, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you know. Um, so for that matter, the hardest, like, to, to go circle in back to what we started with, translation is the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I actually would even say there is no such thing because translation, you can't control translation because there's millions of devices in the world that sound better or worse. And like uh, Bob Ludwig said at one point, he, he made some kind of uh, uh, inquiry into that. And he kind of figured out more or less statistically with JBL, he, he was working with it, yeah. he said, it's not like all speakers are bass heavy or all speakers are now high end heavy. Sure. It's kind of statistically speaking, they are all pretty even, but a lot of them are wrong in very many ways. Right. You know? So he says, you know, you should just try to make the best sounding record and the translation will mean it will sound bad on some uh -huh. and it will sound good on some. Uh -huh. And But that's, where, that's the end where you can control it currently. 
Now, if we are talking well, for we so, we exactly, have some. <laughs> I, I was just like, what, what, what your software could do, or where we're going, is like it could level the playing field, yep. and that is a, uh, a monumental task. And I hope you get there, and I want you to get there so Thank bad you. because it would help me a lot, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, statistically speaking, there is a lot of different systems. Sure. So. What you, what I can actually do with moving a fader, moving an EQ, moving a compressor, cannot currently be influenced by translation mm -hmm. because it will be wrong on some devices. There's just sure. nothing I can do about that. So I try to let that idea of translation go and I just try to go like, what sounds good? And then I hope that the people enjoying it mm -hmm will <laughs> luckily be in front of a device that sounds pretty good, and that's where hopefully you come in. We certainly have a few <laughs> ideas regarding that yes. aspect yes, so of the world. I, th I think I would, it I is would very much like uh, Sonarworks to be the company who kind of helps clean up that circle of confusion, because technically speaking, there is no more a need for us to live in the world where translation problem exists. We can solve for it. It's just. Uh, yeah. No, I'm, just work I, needs to be done. Uh, I'm I'm with you. I think it's important, and it, even if you even if you only gr take uh, uh, some of those devices off the market, uh -huh. if you like basically change the curve of the whole thing and make it more flat, but they're still on the outliers. There are obviously some terrible systems. Yeah. Then you still help the world. Sure. <laughs> you know. So we're we're trying. We're all Doing what, like best. I said earlier. Like we're trying with our little part in the world. I'm making records. You're making software, helping people make better records, make better music. This is all we can shoot for in our little place in the world, making it a little better place for everybody and make a positive impact. Well, that's a beautiful statement. We certainly, I think, are uh, very much thinking on, along, along the same lines at Sonarworks. So mm -hmm. hopefully we all succeed. Oh, yeah, you will. <laughs> <laughs> you will as well. So uh, for somebody who is just starting in music, what would be your, like, one, two, three advice in terms of, I don't know, how they should think about their career to be successful or what they should or shouldn't do. Like, from your experience, what do you think is the key? An engineer in 2022, like somebody who just gets started, uh, I think you have a lot of really exciting opportunities in the way that, for instance, most software that you need to do your job, like I do, mm -hmm. is relatively cheap, mm -hmm. certainly very cheap, considering uh, if you compare it to the time when I came up. Uh -huh. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like the, the great news is like you can literally with a laptop, with the software that's available, and with time, you literally have the same setup that I have, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so you, you can practice things we couldn't, Things with, that were hard to do at the time, you had to like sneak into studios, uh -huh. get studio time. Get, like, you, you can actually practice at home. Um, it's, it's all about connection. And, and what, how that connects with what I just said uh, about you and your work, it's just try to be positive. Positive, like how do I add to the community around me? How do I help a musician be a little bit more successful? How do I help another engineer who like, could be your competitor, right? Mm -hmm. Like once you move that thing out of your mind and go okay. like, how about that could be your best friend and maybe <laughs> you could do this together. Hey, listen to my mix, tell me how yep. I can improve it and he tells you the same thing. I think that's a better way to insert yourself into this music scene and you will come out not with every gig, uh -huh. you're not going to be the most successful right away, with blah, 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 whatever, but you're going to be the most loved and valuable part of this community and that will come back in spades and that is a way to expand your brand even though i don't like that word uh -huh. because your work as a person in this field um, th that's the way to do it so in a, in a way some parts are harder there's not that many studio gigs around that you can learn from people or like be like for instance like I, I was lucky I walked in on a Jay-Z session and uh -huh. all of a sudden be part of one of the most uh, uh, most successful uh, hip-hop albums of all times uh -huh. you know that's that's lucky sorry it was like they say the but preparation you have to place yourself right properly, it was right? the preparation mets opportunity I was not lucky for the gig uh, for, for the job because I I wanted a job I worked on really hard on getting the job but to getting that particular job uh, sure. gig meant to be there 
these these kind of things are important and they're a little harder right now because certainly you're not going to make all of that happen in your bedroom you know like you let's let's put it like this jay-z or let's say uh, uh ghana is not going to walk into your bedroom tomorrow sure. that is pretty sure <laughs> then again, nowadays i guess there are way more and different ways for people how to connect and how to find each other so it's definitely a different world to some extent but yeah. uh, the principle I be, still be of value be of value to other people and they will see it uh, they will they will open doors to you mm -hmm. in, because it feels good to help somebody you know it that's that, that's it really does nobody really wants to not help you those are weird people who don't want to help you but the w people who do they will they will in turn you will help them they will help you all of a sudden you have this connection that will create something together and when the opportunity comes especially in the uh, in the case when there's more than one person needed mm -hmm. more than one engineer uh -huh. for instance right Th guess who they're going to call they're sure. going to call you not <laughs> some dude who like said well i can't help you with that good sure. luck you know <laughs> so uh that is the most important part uh -huh. knowledge itself luckily is available now everywhere. more than ever right now more than ever there's no excuse to not know stuff and you have time to experiment so what a beautiful time to get started and as long as you are patient and realize that this this won't happen in two months mm -hmm. but it could happen very very likely in like two years or five uh -huh. years then that is that's a decent outlook i think like what more chance do you want <laughs> right <laughs> well sounds very inspiring yeah now you have mixed in Atmos for quite some time. Are there any Atmos specific mixing tips that uh, you have discovered that uh, you think might help somebody who is just starting in Atmos? Yeah, I mean, um, one, one of the interesting parts that, that is kind of like that you have to be very careful about is like, so I mentioned earlier, we're looking for a better, more expansive version of the stereo mix mm -hmm. at least in many cases, right? So these might be uh, delivered as stereo stems from the original mix, right? So now, wouldn't it be beautiful if you just aligned those stems and mm -hmm. kind of pan them into space and then everything would be done and you just print print, and you're good? Right. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so no, unfortunately, it's not. Like what, what you will figure out pretty quickly is like even if you make no changes to the actual stems, the actual resulting uh, Atmos mix will sound quite differently than the original stereo mix. So basically, in order to do quality control, you have to figure out, okay, so how far do I have to change the, the stems uh -huh. in order for them to appear as, as if we were never there? So it's a very long, kind of like a QC and also like a translation check, basically, to figure out how to do that. I noticed very often that the vocals, especially if they come in on a stereo stem, they always seem to be a little softer mm -hmm. in the Atmos mix if I just don't do anything. So I, I tend to boost in that a little bit. I tend to put some more ambience on it into the height channels. I might even put the dry part more into the height and also more into the center, a mm -hmm. little bit of the center channel. And so obviously that adds a little bit level to them mm -hmm. officially right if they come out of different channels so that kind of setup together makes them appear as if i had done nothing uh -huh. <laughs> to them but realizing that that there's a difference and that it's really hard to take a stereo stem of any kind so let's say drums and mm -hmm. just put it into an atmos mix and for it to come out the same every single time you change a binaural setting it changes where it appears in the uh -huh. Atmos set, uh, system. And also, even if you set the binaural setting to ze uh, off, yes. it is also not quite the same where, where it lands. So learning how that happens, learning that the, uh, the important parts of the record, vocals, drums, bass, that they kind of, kind of have to be in the same place where they were before, uh -huh. so that you have then uh, the opportunity to take, let's say, guitars or choirs or pads and move them around a little bit more. Uh, that's important. And always double checking, okay, so let me print one, listen to it on the Apple headphones, sure. etc., because that can be only listened to offline, um, not in real time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, 
Th that's important, and just knowing that you you might not be making changes, you might actually just compensating okay. in order for it to arrive as if you had done nothing. But that is the process. That mm -hmm. is the learning curve. Uh, that's why it's a little bit more complicated than just uh, a stereo mix. Thank you. I've been uh, enjoying this conversation on my part, and hope you had fun as well. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. No, thank you so much for stopping by the Mix House here in mm -hmm. L.A. Uh, I had a great time, and uh, this this helps me. This you are helping me well. make better records. That's that's what it's Thank all you. about. <laughs>